So when I actually got back into PC gaming, there were two things that really impressed me. The first was the introduction of the M.2 drive. They are so simple, I pretty much use them on all of our builds, and I probably try to avoid using anything else really. The second is the introduction of the all-in-one cooler. Now back when I used to build PCs, you used to have water cooling, which was for the enthusiasts, and you had air cooling and people generally use the stock coolers. So to actually get a bit of a hybrid was really, really cool. Now because of that, obviously, when our friends at Sahara Gaming reached out to us to see if we wanted to take a look at what they've got on offer, we couldn't refuse. This is the Sahara Gaming EX360. It's a 360mm all-in-one cooler. And today we're going to take you through it and show you what you get. <laughs> So as far as the box goes, it's not that really impressive. It's a white box, shows you what the product is on the front. We've got what the name is. And on the back, we have all the specifications that you need to be able to fit this and understand what you're actually getting. The weirdest thing about the packaging is the logo they've got on the top, and it is cooler than your X. I'm not sure I quite get it, but some people tend to. This is a 360 millimeter AIO system with a radiator, pipes and pump, but it comes with a little bit of a unique design on it, which is what actually really interested us. Obviously the picture on the front gives it away, but we'll open it up and show you what you get. Inside you obviously get a bit of padding, keeps everything nice and safe, and you get your instruction manual. Now this instruction manual is pretty long, even though it's just a piece of paper, but it's got all the instructions you need to be able to fit it into your system, as well as putting the fans on, how to mount the cooler itself, and all that kind of stuff. We'll keep that to the side because I have a feeling with the amount of parts in this, we'll probably be needing it. Next up, we get a couple of bags of goodies. The first is actually this one here, and it comes with a lot of cool things. Inside, we get some thermal paste. That's cool that they've included that. Sometimes they don't, which probably means that it's not actually gonna be applied to the cooler itself. We get a bit of a pad, not sure what that's for, but we'll read the instructions in a bit. Then we get all the mounting screws, washers, even more mounting screws for putting the cooler on, and then a bag of screws that are used to put the fans onto the radiator. So they're normal fan screws, but they're actually quite long. They also provide a splitter cable for the PWM on the fans. That's actually really cool. Thanks for doing that, Sahara Gaming, because so many don't actually include this and they assume you've got all the headers in the world. They also give you a splitter cable for the RGB, and we'll get to that a little bit later. The other bag they include actually has these, and these are the brackets needed to mount the cooler down. This one here is for the AMD. Then we have one for Intel sockets, and then we have a backing plate which should fit on the motherboard. Now I do know that this cooler, looking at the specifications, does fit most of your Intel sockets, apart from the 1700, most of the AMD sockets, and also the extra large Xeon sockets for the 2011 and 1366 sockets. So it's actually pretty dynamic as a fitment, but it would have been nice to see the 1700 in there, particularly when it's been out for a while, but maybe they'll do an actual kit. We'll check that up later. Next up, we have some fans. Now these are fans that are for the radiator system, obviously, and you are provided with three, three 120 millimeter RGB fans. Now, when I was taking a look at this before, I was actually quite impressed with the fans. They are quite heavy. They've got rubber mountings in the corner. They're a bit more of a hybrid fan if you look at the shape of the blade. So you could probably use them as case fans anyway. And they are ARGB, but there is a negative to that because they do use a proprietary connection. As a positive, they do use the standard PWM so you can go straight to a motherboard or use their splitter. But the proprietary one, sometimes it actually quite annoys me a little bit. It's a shame that they did that and they didn't just have a normal three pin ARGB system, but to be able to solve that, they did give you something as well. They provided you with a standard Sahara Gaming controller for your RGB. Now this controller is pretty similar to the ones that we've looked at before, particularly for the Pirate Eye fans. In actual fact, they're exactly the same thing. They use proprietary connections, but you can connect it to your motherboard using a standard connection and control everything from software. So it's a really nice touch that they included this because otherwise you'd be adding on another nearly 20 pounds to the system just to be able to control the ARGB. So again, thank you for doing that Sahara Gaming. Then we come to the main unit. Now this is a 360 millimeter aluminum radiator and I know there was something that you guys wanted me to check and that was, was there any damage on the fins? Because even some of the higher end stuff does come with damage. And looking at this system at the moment, I can't actually see a bent fin on it. We'll take a look at that on a different camera. 
there just isn't a mark on it. So they've actually packaged this quite well, even when some of the bigger brands actually include some cardboard that goes around it and they never bothered. It looks to like they actually do take care when they put these things in the boxes. The pipes themselves come with a braided cable in, which is actually brilliant. I love it when they do that because it looks so much tidier in the system. And the block is pretty impressive too. It's a completely unique shape to what we've seen on other systems. It's a square, it's quite high. It's not as low as some of the ones that come out there. We've obviously got a PWM connect, well, no, it's a normal three pin VC connection, which is okay, because it's basically just got to keep the pump going and usually you set them to a static speed anyway. But again, the RGB in this, because it does have RGB light in that goes down the sides, is actually powered by the proprietary connection on that controller. So again, it's really good that they included that controller, but it would have been nice to actually see it as a standard connection and maybe just get a standard controller because that way you can actually hook it into existing systems even better. But at least I've included the control on that. The other unique thing about this is in the middle, you do actually get a temperature reading. It's a small little LCD that actually takes its temperature from the top of the CPU. I'm not sure how accurate that is in terms of taking temperatures of a CPU, if it's just basically taking the temperature of the surface, but it will actually give you a good reading. And what we'll do is we'll test that to see how accurate that is against some kind of software in like open hardware monitor. And we'll see how accurate it actually is. The other thing I know you guys asked to have a look at was the actual cold plate itself. Now, yes, it is a large piece here because obviously it needs to fit those larger CPUs and it is complete copper all the way through. It does have a sticky on it, so there's no applied thermal paste on this, but it is super smooth and shiny. You can actually see a reflection in it, which goes a little bit better than some of the more premium ones that I've looked at that are actually quite textured and rigid because you have to make sure that you get the mount really perfect for them ones to get that thermal paste to squeeze throughout. But this is actually gonna create a really good connection to the CPU, and I hope that that will actually show itself when we actually do some thermal testing. So this is actually what you get in the box. You actually get quite a lot, particularly for the money of this. It's MSRP is around 130 pounds, which is not bad at all for a 360 millimeter radiator, which particularly has the specifications that this one does. But I do know that it's currently on offer on their website for around 80 to 90 pounds, which is an absolute bargain. So depending on when you're watching this video, make sure you jump over there. We'll put a link in the description so you can get there easily and check it out. So when it comes to installation, I find that reading the instructions, it's gonna be much easier to be able to fit it with the motherboard out. And that's what we've done. We've dropped out our Aorus Pro B450 board. We've already applied thermal paste to the CPU and we're gonna go through the process of actually fitting the block onto the motherboard. To do that, you will need a set of parts and the instructions are very clear on what you need to do. You have parts specific for the AMD because this is obviously an AM4 socket system. And then you just need to follow a bit of a process. But the other reason for taking the board out and not just being able to show you what to do is because of the backing plate they actually include. Now, when you have one of these from somebody like Cooler Master, you generally feed the big screws through the back, just like that. And then there is a plastic clip that goes over the side, which holds that screw in place. And that way you can actually fit it all when it's in a case. But for this one, you can't. Once you actually install it through, there's no plastic clips to be able to hold it in. The screws can just fall straight out. So what we'll do is we'll build it while it's flat down here, and then we'll obviously fit the cooler and we'll refit it back into the system and do some testing. Now again, reading the instructions, I told you we would need to, I figured out what this is for. This is actually a bit of a gasket that goes onto this metal bracket here. And depending on which system you're going for, whether it's an Intel fit, which goes that way around, or whether it's an AMD fit, it goes that way around, it actually just goes over the top, just like that, so that none of the metal can actually touch any of the connections on the back of the board. So we'll install that first. Now that we've got the sticker on, we can start inserting the screws through. There are different placements for this, so you're gonna to have to probably wait up to the board that you've got. But all we do is we simply just pop the screws through the back, rotate them round, and then they'll just lock, kind of lock into place, but they will fall back out again. So we may need to do some more adjustment. Unlike other AIOs, obviously this, some of them fit to the clamps already existent on an AM4 board, but we're gonna have to actually remove them because this one actually uses a screw down system, which I actually like. I prefer that because then you don't have these big bulky screws sticking out the top. So we'll take these plugs off now. With the backing plate removed, obviously we just need to line up the new backing plate and drop the motherboard down on top of it. Before we do that, we need to install some washers and they do provide loads of different washers. First, we'll install some plastic ones straight over the top of the screws like that. And then we'll drop the motherboard over the top.
Now that we've actually got that backing plate installed, we need to install some more plastic washers and they simply just push down onto it. And at this point, the bracket should actually stay in place. There shouldn't be any need for it to move anywhere. So at least if it is in your case and in your system, you could probably get up, if you can get up to this point, then you could probably install it that way. But I don't want to do that because I don't want to accidentally damage it. Next up, we want to install these nuts on top and they simply just thread down into the system onto the motherboard. And you want to make sure that the wide end is the bit that's actually going down because it needs to be able to cut through some of the unthreaded piece. So we'll get them added on. Now that we have the big nuts installed, we need to install the actual mounting bracket onto the pump itself. To do that, it's very simple. We'll pull the plastic off so that we can actually get to it. All we need to do is slide this bracket onto the side of the pump and click it into place. Just like that. The other ones that I've used that actually work this way are things like the Fractal Lumen. It's actually a pretty good setup and it keeps it really bound to the board really well. And all we need to do is then just line it up and drop it onto those plugs. Adding on the now the metal washers onto the top, we can start to install these screw down with a spring loaded screws. And these have a screwdriver top, so we can screw that down quite well. We'll pop one on the other corner because we always make sure that when we install these, we go to corner to corner so that there's equal pressure being bound down onto the uh, CPU. And that is now all installed. The one thing that I didn't show you, and that's because I removed it before anyway, is that remember you have to take the plastic cover off the bottom of the pump itself. Otherwise you're gonna get into thermal problems later. It's just a quick peely, you just peel it straight off and that way then the block can actually connect to the CPU properly. Now what we need to do is install this into a system and we're not gonna install the fan straight away because the setup we've got, and we're gonna be using a Sahara gaming case as well, is one where the radiator is inside the system and the fans are gonna be mounted from the outside. So we'll get this thrown into a system now and we'll do some testing. Okay, so we've now got everything installed into the case apart from one thing. And I thought, well, before we do some testing, I would show you how to do that if you haven't watched one of our videos before. And that is how to install the actual controller they provide with you to make sure that the RGB lighting and stuff works. Now inside the controller box, you will obviously get the controller itself and it's basically got 10 proprietary connections and it does have a feed so you can do it from your motherboard or reset switches. And this one does come with buttons so you can control it on top of there. And it does come with a SATA connection. So obviously we wanna hook that up. It also comes with a remote control, a very basic system, but it allows you to control the lighting however you want. It comes with a couple of cables. So this is how you actually can feed from your motherboard PWM as well as your ARGB lighting. You basically plug that into your motherboard and it comes with different connections and it goes straight into the hub itself. Now the fans that we've got don't actually control their speed from the hub itself. They can just go straight onto a PWM connection. So that will actually work great. One thing that we won't need to use is actually this little splitter they gave us for the ARGB lighting. And that's because we can simply just go into the controller with all the different things. So we'll flip the case on its top and we'll show you how we do that. So obviously now we have the back of the case and we have all these cables coming through from the fans at the front. And we've actually installed the cables onto the motherboard for things like the PWM. So for PWM connections, all we need to simply do is find the connection plug them all into the splitters and they should work fine. And we've connected that to the CPU header because obviously we want those fans on the radiator to be controlled based on the temperature of the CPU. Once we have all those PWM connections, we are left with the propriety system for the ARGB lighting. Now this case does come with an ARGB fan in the rear, but we're not gonna be controlling that from the controller today. We're just basically gonna set it up just to control those front ones. And as well as that, the one that actually comes from the CPU block itself. And all to do that, we just simply plug them in to the side of the controller. And that's the three front fans done. Then we just need to find the one from the block itself, which is in here somewhere. We took it through, which is this one. And that's the same connection and it'll go into there find a nice little place to mount it, which we'll put it there for now, and a spare SATA connection just to power it up. 
Now obviously this is not a very well cable managed system and I wouldn't advise leaving it like this, but we're going to because all we're going to do is just some thermal testing. So we will drop on the side just to keep it all safe and secure. And we're pretty much ready to go. Okay, and there we have it. We've actually got it installed into the system and we've done a bit of benchmarking on it. We did compare it to the standard AMD Wraith Max cooler because if you're going to upgrade to something like this, you're probably coming from a stock cooler. Now that cooler is a bit of a monster, particularly for the CPU in this. We benchmarked it against the AMD Ryzen 5 2400G. It's just one that we have in the test system. It's not necessarily a super hot chip. It actually runs at about 65 watts. So the TDP is pretty much on average with what everybody would have out there. In terms of the cooler itself, it performed really well. It knocked several degrees off, uh, particularly over a long run of Cinebench R23. We actually run multiple times and just to check, you know, did it actually manage to keep the CPU cool? And it sure did. The AMD Wraith max now at around 62 degrees after uh, several runs of Cinebench, whereas the EX360 managed to maintain it below 60 all the way through. So that's pretty cool. There was a few little quirks with the features on this one because we noticed a few things. Once it was all installed, sometimes the LCD doesn't actually come on. We're not sure why that is. It came on to begin with and it managed to run all the way through the test. But then for some reason it does go off. I don't know whether that's because the system goes to sleep or how it would even know that the system's gone to sleep or not. I'm not quite sure. But it does eventually return and it provides the temperature of something. And I say something because it's not actually the temperature of the CPU. Now, according to their website, it does actually get the temperature from the surface of the CPU. But I don't think that's quite true because while the system was running at around 60 degrees on the CPU, the actual temperature sensor in the front was providing around the 24 degrees and that would actually go up and down slowly over time. So I would suspect that it's actually going by the water in the system, which is actually more useful than showing the CPU surface temperature because you can easily check that in some kind of software. But I would really like to know from Sahara Gaming, where does it actually get the temperature from? If it is from the water, I can find it could be pretty useful. If it is from the surface of the CPU, it probably doesn't work too well. But overall, the cooler looks super awesome. With the RGB lighting matched to the rest of the system, it looks pretty good. The RGB fans on the front actually work brilliantly and they're not too loud. Once the system does get up to speed, they can get pretty loud as they get up there, but then most fans do. But then with any fan, you can change it anyway. So you could put some kind of noctuas on a thing like this, which is probably what we'll do if we leave it in this case, because obviously there's no point having RGB on the front of a case that you can't see it. All in all, we're impressed with the quality of this cooler and we want to know what you think. So drop your comments down below. Would you consider getting something like this from Sahara Gaming? And if so, what kind of prices would you pay? Because these things are pretty cheap as it comes to 360 millimeter AIOs. We like it a lot and we're going to keep it around. It's actually going to go in a system that we've already got planned for. So make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to see that. Or make sure you follow us on social media because we generally share pictures of these kind of things beforehand. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more like this. And also drop us a like on this video if you like this kind of content. And we'll catch you in the next one.